I'm really, really excited for us to jump into this conversation. I first want to chat through some of your titles. So you are a writer, you are an author, you are a mother, you are a friend, you are a daughter, you are a girlfriend. Which one of these titles, and you can add more if you need to, are serving your inner child the most? Well, I feel like I've come to a place in my life and very definitely in the pandemic where I just realized I was at a place where family, belonging, home, that's kind of the holy grail for me. That's like the last final frontier is to create secure primary attachment. And um, that is something that I just became very focused on probably starting in 2019. So there are definitely times, obviously I love my career. I love the work I do. It is extremely important to me, but there are times where what's even more important to me is home and creating that for myself, Mm. because that's the one thing I never had as a foster child. So um, I don't know that that's a role. I think it's a, it's an, it's a place, Mm. you know, and there's a lot that goes along with that. That's about nurturing. It's about taking care of the people I love. It's about relationships, Mm. you know, first and foremost. You just said it like, it it looks it's not a specific it's a it's a place right and so what are some of those things in that place what are the some of those because you move around a lot you have um you know a busy life what does home look like for you well my house plans <laughs> <laughs> my chicken marinade it's doing laundry like I keep a home I have a really beautiful home that yes. I keep with my partner I love taking care of people you know Um, so that's what home looks like. And it looks like, uh, prioritizing relationships and connection. Uh, it doesn't mean work isn't important. I just feel like as women, maybe for my, my generation, I know I overcorrected on the work side. I put work first. I thought work had to be first. I thought work was the most important thing. And then the pandemic hit and I looked around because there was no more work Mm. for a minute and you're just all by yourself in your house going, wait a minute, wait, what? So that got me real clear on something that I'd started to get clear about. Um, So I'm not commenting on anybody else or what they want to do. I think we all come in here to figure out what we need. And then you make sure that you go out there and, you know, create the life for yourself. That's the healing for you, you know, and that's different for everybody. For some people that's going to be, you know, um, something in the world or who knows, I'm, I'm hoping for a balanced life. Like I've had a lot of great things in my life and I have a really balanced life. It's just that if I had to prioritize, um, I would prioritize home. Yes. I'm dying for grandchildren. I enjoy <laughs> this. Not close to them, but I want yes. Them. <laughs> I enjoy that so much. And to be honest, you have been married before. You've been married three times. So from I wouldn't yeah. have thought you would say that you weren't prioritizing finding love prior to the pandemic. What do you think was like the switch there? Well, the last time I got married was in uh, 2004. Mm-hmm. So that's almost 20 mm-hmm. years ago. I was married uh, very young in my teens, you know, once in the 80s, once mm-hmm. in the 90s and once in the zero <laughs> zeros. So I didn't live with anyone, marry anyone for you know, 18 Mm -hmm, years. mm -hmm. And um, so, yeah, that's me not prioritizing relationships. Sure. I had relationships I was in, but they were not relationships where I was creating home Mm. with that person. So what do you think about the noise? I call it in some cases, and let's say the conversation that men and women are having right now, what do you think they're saying versus what do you think they should be saying? I'm like, are men and women having a conversation? Oh my right God. Now? Are they? <laughs> I, 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 don't know. I don't, I don't, I don't think that I, my personal, like I have some radical ideas. Say it, in this say area. the radical, I, cannot wait. To me, the radical idea is not every man is built to like be your BFF. That's a whole other layer and way for a woman such as myself, who's high touch, high relational, like super emotionally like on point, I mean, there's not going to be that many men who are going to be either interested or, uh, you know, playing basketball at my level. Mm. So I do that with women. Mm. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I'm not looking. My man does not have to be that. That is not what he needs mm. to be. He needs to be grounded and 
kind of unflappable and high integrity and caring um, and prioritizing. He does not need to be uh, talking all the time. Yeah. So the conversation between men and women, I don't necessarily need to be, that's not a conversation I need to be having with my partner most of the time. Mm. Most of the time I'm having that conversation with my friends and then I'm bringing what I develop in my friendships, my understandings, my, a lot of my regulation, you know, emotional regulation and understanding of the world is not coming from conversations I'm having with my partner. It's coming from conversations I'm having with Mm. my friends. And I'm speaking specifically, I'm not talking about politics. Mm. I'm talking about relationship yeah. stuff. You're, I, I'm assuming what you mean when you say, what's the conversation between men and women? For me, that's a conversation <laughs> with women. Yeah. It is not, the relationship conversation is not one I'm having with a man, not my man. That's really, you know? I love, I love that. I think there's some radical responsibility that women can take in that because I do think that women have a, you know, we have such a high tolerance for emotional conversations that it's a bit unfair for us to put that. I'd like, I'm hearing you and I'm like, I love that. I also think that right now men and women are having such a, you know, depends on how you interpret it, but it's like, I mean, a battle or just like a battle of the sexes in some way. And I'm like, wait, 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 guys, like, I don't, you know what I'm saying? I'm like, I don't know why we're, I thought we have so much value to bring to each other. We have so much like yin and yang to bring to each other. And so I'm wondering how can we at least add to, to the conversation. Let's just say somebody gives us a second to, to, to just l- listen to me and Tracy right now. What can we add to the conversation to have people kind of halt and turn around and look back at themselves to be able to attract the person, the man and the woman that they want? Well, I think it's about knowing who you are and what you need. So, you know, 70% of relation, uh, relationship problems are unsolvable. That's the research. So you're really just, when you choose a partner, you're choosing a particular set of unsolvable problems. Mm -hmm. (laughs) (laughs) So you want to pick somebody who has the right things wrong with them for you, right? So I know myself now. I know what I need. And I know what I, like, I know what I must get from a man for me personally in terms of partnership. And I know what I don't need to get from him, you know? And I just think you want to make good choices for you. Mm. And that is about knowing who you are. And then you accept, you accept your man or partner. I'm not trying to be heteronormative, but I do think polarities generally attract, whether it's feminine energy person and a masculine energy person, that's the relationship I want to be. There are people who want to be in a more neutral, like a a more neutral energy. Um, That's fine too. I don't have any judgment. I don't really care what people do. (laughs) What I care about is that they love doing Mm. it. You know what I'm saying? How do we create that? Um, So for me, it starts with knowing who I am and what I need. What are some of the early triggers you experienced in relationships that led you to now I know what I need? Like what were some of those things that then you experienced and you thought, am I supposed to like work through this or let this go? And how did you figure that out? Well, I don't think I figured it out. I think what happens is you just commit to being you more and more you aligning with what is highest in you and everybody who doesn't match that will float out of your mm. orbit. You don't really even have to like get rid of them per se. They will go away. You just have to let them be <laughs> when they go. Mm. <laughs> and that can sometimes be the hard part or like hanging on to something that's trying to leave. You know, you're like, no. The other thing is sometimes trying to get rid of something that's still there. Mm. That happens too. Like I came to the point where I was like, okay, like I know this really, I was in a relationship for a number of years where I was like, this is not my forever home as it were. Um, But it also wasn't yet time to go. And I could honor that because there was no actual rush. Um, I don't, I guess what I do is I, I just, receive wisdom more. I want to channel something. I'm less interested in when I was younger, I would have a lot of ideas that I would execute on. And I was like careening around doing this, doing that. I was almost a little too active in all of it. Like, this is what I see. Like we have an idea. A relationship should be like this. A man should be like this. A woman should be like that. And then when reality doesn't conform to our ideas, we, we 
dump whatever's happening and try to go find another thing. Mm. And but of course, wherever you go, there you are. So I feel like I started to live, you know, it's less like the things that were going on. It was more this. This was the key for me was to flip and go, okay, I'm here for the highest good. Every day I'm going to wake up and my prayer is going to be, I'm here to be used. I'm here to be, um, you know, whatever I can do to serve my immediate world and the bigger world. I'm here mm -hmm. for that. And you show me, mm -hmm. you know, universe, mm -hmm. God, you show me what mm -hmm. to do and mm -hmm. I'll do it. And then I assume that everything that happens after that is part of the answer. Mm -hmm. So that means if something's in front of me for now, I'm either, I'm either uh, looking at it and going, yes, or I'm looking at it and going, hmm, please take this out of my world if it's not supposed mm -hmm. to be here. Because like, I don't know about you, but I don't know that people can just break primary attachments like that. That's why people stay in bad relationships. Cause in some ways it's a very, very, very hard thing to do once you've created a primary attachment to um, sever that mm. people will stay in terrible relationships for a long time, not getting their needs met because they don't know how to sever a primary attachment, but it's, it's made to be that way. It's chemically that way. So the work of moving forward in relationships can be very difficult and acknowledging mm. that is the first yeah. step. How do you think one can decipher a need versus a want? So you know how we attract somebody and we're like, they're not what you wanted, but it's what I needed. And I'm like, mm -hmm. how do you know mm. that? Like what, what is the deciphering factor there? Well, a want, I want to say it's like, a, it's very, it's, it's intangible, but it, your body will tell you like a want is you could live without it. You know, you could live without it. You're like, uh, I don't know. Let's take hair color. You know mm. what I'm saying? Like, does he have to have brown hair? Mm. I don't know. Maybe, maybe that's so important to right. you. So take a snapshot of what it feels like to want something like that. Something that's not a need, obviously. Now go to a need. Um, like for me, a need would be a good example of a need would be grounded. Mm. So, and high mm. integrity. So how do I know about high integrity? Well, a person who's high integrity is going to naturally be taking accountability as they go along in a conversation. You're just going to hear him say things like, well, and I learned this, or that's what I realized about what happened, or they're going to say things that are high integrity mm. things. Now, if a person is kind of slippery or they have hustle like that, I don't like that because, you know, I had a hustler dad. I don't trust <laughs> hustle. I don't want to see it. I want ground. Yeah, yeah. So if I, if some dude comes in and they're all just like on their swagger and all that, I just feel like mm -mm, that's not yeah, for me. Yeah. I'm never going to feel yeah. safe there. I know that mm. about me. I don't have to talk myself into it. Mm. You know, I don't have to talk. This is the other thing. If you have to talk yourself into something, I just want to go, you're never going to get over that thing. That's my experience. That's my experience. If you hear yourself talking yourself into or out of something, no, stop. Just stop for a minute and take a breath. That's really good. What is the last thing you forgave yourself for for the first time? Probably, you know, I mean, this is going to sound silly, but because nobody's a perfect mother, but probably for not being a perfect mother. Like as much as I was like so conscious, so aware, so working on it, they're definitely, my son's going to be 26. At 26, you're, they talk to you. They say, okay, here's where you, <laughs> here's what didn't work for me. <laughs> here's this way that sure. I felt. And then I had to go, oh yeah. Cause there was a lot of childhood trauma that I had that caused me to bring certain things into my mothering. Like, um, it was, it was very challenging for me in a, in this very subtle way to be close. I was afraid. Mm. I didn't know it. I didn't know it, but I was afraid. And I, I was like, it was scary for me to become a mother. I was barely aware of how scary mm. it was because I mean, my God, I'd had the most, you know, 
hardcore infancy. I was put into foster care at three months. Like I had 12 Saturday nights with a primary attachment figure and she gave me away. Like, of course there was stuff Mm. there. And as much as I did so much work to avoid passing it down in any way, it's just not possible to not pass some of your stuff down. And it comes out sideways. It's not like, um, you know, I was actually a really, really good mom, but that doesn't mean I was Mm. perfect. And I can see the parts where I, oh, I could have done that better. Oh, I could have been more attuned. Oh, I could have done this Mm. better. So, but I forgive myself because forgiving myself allows me to take ownership of it and take ownership of it allows me not, allows me not to like pass it the cost to my son. When parents don't take responsibility, children have to pick up the Mm. check because they know what happened. So if you go, well, I don't even know what you're talking about. Then all you're saying is you, you pay the bill. If I say, oh, wow, I know what you're talking about. I get that. Then you're saying, it's okay. That was on me. You don't have to pay that bill emotionally. So this is the accountability I'm talking yeah. about. And and whatever you want in a partner, basically you have to be it, you 100%. know? <laughs> well, thank you for sharing that. And it leads me to think about, okay, so if people want to approach their parents with a moment of accountability and their parents aren't receptive, you know, it, if it hurts their ego yeah. in that moment or really makes them sad. It's not an easy yeah. thing to hear. It's very painful. I, I'm, uh, I can see that and I am sensitive to that even personally, but how does one go about forgiving a parent who says, Hey, I need you to pay the bill. Like if they're just, they're not able to take that. Cause a larger point of that in, at least in imprisoned, we do see your dad take accountability. Mm-hmm. I assume that that's a reflection mm-hmm. of your life as well. But what are about moments that people don't? Well, my dad was less accountable probably than my TV. Oh, dad. <laughs> interesting. Okay. Okay. Just because my dad did have a hard time acknowledging, I want to say pervasive, but it's bigger. It's it. That's not exactly mm. the word, but it was profound. The effect that his choices had yeah. on my life. And I think he wanted to look at my success in the world and go, well, you're fine. You know, mm. look, it all turned out or you're overblowing it, you know? So he left me with his girlfriend and I talk about this in the show. It's in the, it's in the first episode. He left me with his girlfriend instead of like, uh, allowing me to stay in my foster home where I was actually very safe. He took me out of there. I went to live with him and his girlfriend. And then she raised me for the next 10 years. And I mean, she was a nightmare. That's the, (laughs) the long and the short of it is that it was really, really Mm. painful. And what, happened in real life is he died on January 21st and she died the next day. So both of these parents died in a 24 hour period, like two months ago. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that. Now, part of me, it's okay. It was intense for sure. They'd only seen each other once in 40 years, but the level of connection was still there. You're like, how is this possible? Or, or it's for me, it's happening for me. You know, like what if it's not, I say it in the show. What if it's not happening to you? It's happening for you. Like, what if they died in 24 hours for me? Wow. Now, obviously they were in their life journey. I had no control over how they decided to come in or go out or be in my life or any of it. Now I can say them dying in 24 hours is very similar to the way (laughs) they impacted me in life. You know, I was like, dude, do you guys have to make it as hard as possible on me all the time? And I guess the answer was yes. But so my dad was never able to fully own how hard it was that he left me with his girlfriend Mm. and how she was. He could never, ever own that. Mm. So what did I, how did I forgive him? I just understand his limits. Like I sort of think, well, this is as deep as he got to Mm. go in life. And there's some real grief around that. It's not so much forgiveness we need to do. It's that we need to be willing to feel the grief of what happened. And if you can just sit with the grief, the forgiveness will come because you'll just, you'll soften. The grief softens you and you just go, wow, it was super painful. Um, I didn't get what I needed. And, you know, I guess that's his fault, but it more is just what happened. How about that? And 
you know, how can we make meaning out of it? Okay, I'll write a TV show. I'll write books. I'll do whatever is my talent and try to process this and help other people process theirs. And that's what's led me to, I wouldn't, I mean, forgiveness, I don't even know what that means sometimes, mm. but it's like, it's led me to peace. Mm. I have peace. Were there moments, thank you for sharing that, Tracy, were there moments that before he passed and she passed that you thought you could do something? Like once you recognize, oh, okay, they have limits. Did you think your wisdom or your spirituality or your growth could do anything? No. No. <laughs> mm. no uh I had very, I had a lot of distance from her. Like I say in the show, like she has a radius, like she has nunchucks and you just got to stay out of the mm. radius. So I had a very kind of limited, but peaceful relationship with her. I didn't know she was dying. I had no idea. It was a complete surprise to me. My dad had cancer. I knew he was dying. No, I wasn't going to impact him mm. either. Mm. I know that. Not really. I mean, there were times probably every once in a while I would be like, but can't you acknowledge this? And he couldn't. And that's okay. Cause he's a human. Yeah. And then I think maybe as you get older, you just start to realize like, I don't have to resist where this human is. I can just accept where yes. this human is, yes. you know, so good. and then place myself in a spot that feels comfortable. So I could be, I could place myself closer to my dad than I could to his girlfriend with her. I had to place myself out of the frame for the mm. most part with my dad. I can like, I can be here, you know, he's not, I mean, in the TV show, he comes to live with me in real life. No, cause he couldn't be mm. that close. He's not that trustworthy. Mm. I couldn't trust mm. him that much. And it doesn't mean like, I think he's going to steal from me. It means like, I don't want him that close to me. I get to feel good and yeah, feel safe. Yeah. How are you feeling with his passing and the show about to kind of relive that without being alongside him? Oh, it's, I want to say there's this one weird thing when, you know, my dad was in prison for probably a, a grand total of like 37 years. He lived in the phone. And so he wasn't a presence in that way. Mm. He lived in the phone. So I wanted to say there's a way in which now this is the humor is like, he's in the great phone in the sky now. <laughs> like he's just still over mm. there, wherever he is. Mm. So it's not like I really know he's gone yet. It's only been yeah. two months. Like it's entirely possible that I would go two months without talking to him. So that's one wow. piece. Um, second of all, the other, I do use a lot of humor in my life. It's like, I, I want to say the two of them really did not want to see themselves in my TV show. <laughs> they were like, we're out of here. <laughs> oh my God, Tracy. No, we don't, don't want to know, wow. you know, that was like one of my first thoughts. I'm like, they really didn't want to see my show because they don't want to come to Jesus <laughs> about what I have to say. And they never did. And they really don't. And so whatever. Oh, wow. So that's another piece. So how do I carry it? It's fine. It really is oh. fine. They don't need to see it. I didn't write it for them or to them. I wrote it for the, I wrote it for them if they wanted to see it, but they didn't. Yeah. But I wrote it for catharsis for wh whoever yeah. wants it. You know what I'm saying? I wrote it for myself. I wrote it for the people on set. I wrote it for people who have loved ones who were in prison. I wrote it for people who were in mm. prison, you know? Um, I wrote it for people who don't know anybody in prison and need to ho open their hearts and minds. Yeah. Like, you know, and also I'm just putting it out there and it's kind of not my business who God. watches it. <laughs> this is Gordon. You, you basically answered my, one of my last questions of like, what do you want people to experience those who either have, you know, especially kids with incarcerated parents, what do you want them to take away? How do you want them to see themselves in this story? Well, I want them to see themselves as whole, wonderful people who are worthy of love and that there's, I want to reduce the stigma and normalize this experience because a lot of people are having this experience. Um, I want to hopefully have that changed hearts and minds lead to changed policy. Mm. Um, I, I'm not a political person in that way, but I'm doing my yeah. part. And then the people who have, are, have a more activist heart, um, then they can do what they're mm. best at. Mm. You know, um, I feel like we all just do what we're best at and bring that to situations that, you know, that need light, yeah. you know, or healing. Amazing. So, um, yeah, I hope that we start a big conversation 
about what this is for Amazing. people and how people are impacted. Yeah, I hope we do as well. I, I definitely felt that very deeply while experiencing the show. So many big, big ideas, big human things that we had to experience and deal with on such a like humorous and life level. I thought that was really gorgeous. So well done in that area. And I just want to end with, you talk so deeply about self-love in the way that that impacts our relationships. Are there some ways that we might not be treating ourselves well in our mind, in our body, in our souls, and not even know it? Like there's those obvious things, right? It's like when you tell yourself like you're stupid or you're dumb, like, okay, those are obvious, right? right. But there's a lot of little things yeah. as humans we do that we might not realize are contributing to how we see ourselves and that therefore what we attract. What are some of those things? Well, I mean, the thing I would almost say, or just, I just speak from my current experience, I'm sort of realizing like i don't have to be getting better all the time what if i just learn to be here with what is oh in me and that's like kind of the ultimate love is like i just accept me right here mm. imperfect still you know because i've done a lot of like work and the work is super important but at a certain point you have i my orientation is shifting to okay let's just say it's okay. We're right here and it's yeah. fine. And not everything is going to be, it's basically about living with what's unresolved in a really gentle way, rather than constantly thinking, I'm going to get better. I'm going to get better. I feel like that's a way that we don't love ourselves right where we are. It's like, actually, we want to love ourselves right here. Totally imperfect. Not fixed. Not done. Not healed. <laughs> Just a little bit just here, you know what I mean? We're just here. It's Friday. <laughs> We're doing it. Tracy you know? McMillan, everybody. I have to have you on for a part two. My God, what a gorgeous conversation. So much humanness to exchange, so much humanity to exchange. I really appreciate your time. Thank you. I'm glad we worked it out. Hope you have a beautiful rest of your day and safe travels. Thank you. Thank you so You're much. Welcome. Bye. Bye.